Today we're jumping into a conversation, and uh, this conversation is knowing Jesus is this conversation. Now, we have a collection of talks we're going to have over the next couple weeks around spiritual formation, around our spiritual formation, how we are making up faith, the decisions we are making daily. So we talked about last week, what Jesus talked about, uh, talked about being his follower, it was you got to give up your life. If anybody wants to be my disciple, what do you say? you got to give up your way. We talked about that last week. Your way and what? Follow me or pick up your cross and follow me daily. Not not like yesterday, not the day before. It's like right now today, you got to cross the bear and and a life in in order to live and decisions that you need to make. Follow me. Right? That's a decision that we make on a daily basis, following him. And our spiritual formation is made up of the decisions we are making on a daily basis that ultimately are the result of our pursuit of Jesus. As we go after Jesus, he illuminates our lives. And then we fall into this place of pursuit of Jesus that our decisions will follow in accordance to relationship. You know, Jesus talks about when it's the pursuit of something, he talks about the light that would illuminate inside of our life. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, it says, Your eye is a lamp. That provides light to your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, whoo, how deep that darkness is. It's speaking to this reality on what are you pursuing that now is illuminating your life. What are you tuned in today that you are chasing and you are desiring that has your attention and has your affection? And whatever that is, is either going to illuminate or it's going to bring darkness. And it's like how dark that darkness is in your life when you think that you are pursuing light and it's actually darkness and you think it's light on the inside of you. Come on, you find in Luke chapter 18 or Luke chapter 15, verse 11, you can tell the story right here of the, the lost son that pursued darkness. And what happened? His life was completely illuminated with darkness. And he picked his head up one day and said, how far I am away from my father. The least in my father's house is better than the the best here. It's that realization on, wow, I've been chasing the wrong things. I've been focused on all the wrong things. And with that, the illumination of my light has not been light. It's been darkness. And today, we're going to talk about knowing Jesus and that spiritual formation, building up our faith that we know Jesus, just don't know about him, that we have this understanding inside of our life on who he is and how we should live. It's the construction of our faith, and this is done daily, not in a day. Salvation's on a day. Salvation happens in a moment. Sanctification in the building of the faith happens Daily. Daily. Come on, anybody know that things used to be built right back in the day? Anybody? <laughs> they used to build things better back in the day. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, anybody in here over 40? They, they used to build things better. <laughs> things and people, right? You know what my, my first vehicle was? My first vehicle was this right here. Bang. Come on, this beauty. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, I want that. In 99, you didn't want that, though. That's an 85 Chevrolet. And you definitely didn't want the one that I had, okay? The 85 Chevrolet that I had, my brother previously drove it. And my brother just so happened to be crazy. Anybody got crazy siblings? So my brother was driving the 85 Chevrolet, and he was running that thing in circles at a gas station out in the country, out at uh, 1604 in uh, Sulphur Springs. That's where we run. We run out there. Don't talk to anybody about me out there, okay? None of the stories are true. Okay, he was running some donuts, and all of a sudden he hit like a rock or something. Boop! That truck got on the side. Beep. They had to pull it back over. Ding, 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 ding. There was one time my brother was driving, he smelled smoke, he pulled over the side of the road, and it was on fire underneath the hood. Thank God we had a fire extinguisher, okay? This is the first car that I got, okay? <laughs> If anybody got something better, I will slap you, okay, if you're complaining about what you have. If you complain about what you got, I got a hand that will help you out, in Jesus' name, okay? <laughs> you know this truck? Like, it was flipped on its side, 
caught on fire, and it was still running. It smelled a little funky. It flipped on its side. It had no dent in it. Like, it was all made out of steel and metal, not plastic. Today, if you flip something on its side, you can still run, but it's totaled, okay? To fix it, it'll cost you $100,000. You're like, the car is worth $3,000. What are you talking about? <laughs> they were built different. They just built things different back in the day. I mean, there's washing machines out there that are still running, but they were built in the 1920s. Now, I don't know why you would still use it, but it was still, I mean, it still works. It's functional. There's a few people like, yeah, it works. It's great. It's awesome. Time to upgrade. No, we're good. That's my father-in-law. Um, <laughs> they just built them different back in the day. Come on. You remember, uh, they, they, used to, they used to just build people different. Like, if you're the, over the age of, like, 45, 50, yeah, you're, you're just built different, okay? You drive a little slower, but you're just built different. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, the way you were raised, <laughs> built different. Right, you've had to go through some adversity. You know what it means not to live in a digital age connected to everybody. You know what it means to get outside and sweat and run around with your friends and like be rejected by somebody but not feel like you want to, uh, uh, I slowed that row real quick. <laughs> not feel like you uh, are mentally challenged by that. You're just like, oh, bump them. Okay, all good. They got something to say, we gonna settle it on the playground in Jesus' name, okay? <laughs> We're gonna see who wins here, you know? You just build different, you know what I mean? You just build different. All the young people are like, I don't, what are you talking about? That sounds really hard, bad. <laughs> you settle things on the playground. You're like, we're going to deal with this right here today. You got something to say? Okay. <laughs> I'm not advocating for harm. Okay, anybody in here? Not advocating for harm? I'm just saying, you're built different. I'm talking about a generation. Y'all don't, if you don't understand right now, don't hold it against me. We know, okay? <laughs> built different. Just things were built different. Back in the day, stronger, better quality. People were built better. They, they were able to walk through challenges and, and, and be resilient. There's literally statistics that show that individuals that, that lived through the Great Depression and, and weren't in like abject poverty, just like complete poverty, and, and weren't well to do, they, they had to face the reality and endure through the Great Depression. They did studies on them later in life. They were happier, they were healthier, they were more content about their lives. They just knew what it meant to have nothing and be able to work for something and have something. Like they, they were built different. I'm just gonna tell you today, when it comes to faith, our relationship with Jesus, we gotta build different. We gotta have some, some deepness and some revelation. We gotta have some adversity about life. We gotta be able to hang on in hard times. It can't be all easy to us. Jesus would tell us that that's not the reality and you should expect that reality, right? Adversity you're gonna face inside of life, challenges you will face, but what did he say? Take heart for I have overcome the world. And so it's, you're going to face the adversity but trust my power. You only get to trust the power when you've tested it. But how many of us in our faith today, we're like, I'm good so long as God is showing up and being good to me, or at least my perception that he is doing, being good for me. It's not our faith that's being built up in strength that we can face adversity. We're good until we perceive God is not good. That is an immature faith. And I'm telling you today, in your spiritual formation, we got to grow up and mature. We got to pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus, whether we've known Jesus for a year or we've known him for 40 years. We are still picking up our cross daily and following Jesus Christ. This is for everybody. Do you know Jesus or do you know about Jesus? Jesus' call to us, when he, when he called out and, and bringing people along for the journey, yes, it was pick up your cross and follow me. But there was another experience that individuals had that laid them down, weighed them down, I should say it that way. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and carry heavy burdens. I say it the way I've grown up. I'm just like, just say it. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. His yoke is his teachings. What do you get? A religious society that was overwhelmed with the do's and don'ts, the legalistic mentality around what it meant to follow 
uh, uh, to, to know God. And Jesus says, man, if you are so tired from a religious spirit overwhelming you with the do's and don'ts, and there's not a freedom in your relationship, in your pursuit of God, that it's easy to come to him and apply the way of Jesus in your life or the way of God in your life, then you got to come to me is what he's saying. If you are overwhelmed in trying to follow God, then you are not following Jesus. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. Let me teach you. Let me tell you how you should live, how you should think, how should you should face adversity, how you should conduct yourself in the face of adversity, how you should, how should, you should uh, 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 deal with people that are challenging, how you should face your enemies. Let me teach you how you should do that because you may be overwhelmed with the teachings of man but not illuminated by the light of my message. This is Jesus. He gets all into the trenches. His way is easy. The way of Jesus is easy. Let me just tell you, if you don't let go of your way, as we talked about last week, the first thing to following Jesus is it can't be your way. And if you're unwilling to let go of your way, your desires, your, your sinful actions, my thinking that's not biblical, if you're unwilling to let it go, then what are you constantly doing? You're fighting the way of righteousness. And then it becomes so hard. Oh, I'm overwhelmed. I got to do good. It's like, no, it should be easy to do good. It should be easy to love your neighbors. It should be easy to love people that are broken and hurting. That should be easy. Oh, I'm overwhelmed by the do's and don'ts. I got to show up and I'm much better than everybody else. And look at me, I'm at church and I'm better. It's very easy to lose sight of who Jesus is when we're in the pursuit of doing everything that's right in our eyes. Jesus is like, get away from that. My my teachings will set you free. I am gentle, I'm kind, I'm loving. I will help you know what this means and live a life that honors God. But you gotta let go of your way. John 15, what does Jesus say? He says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. What is Jesus speaking to? It's like, it's connection. But you got to remain. The remaining is a choice that we make. Some of us come to know Jesus, but we don't remain in Jesus. You ever grown up in a house and all of a sudden you became a stranger? There was a moment in time in which you were in deep, intimate relationship with your mom and dad. You walked into that house and you felt the overwhelming love of your parents in your life. And, oh, man, you felt so loved and and, and so protected and so connected. And you walked in every day and you were like so excited. And, hey, mom, hey, dad, how you doing? And they're like, how you doing? You're like, ah, it's great. And then all of a sudden, there was a day you walked in and you felt alone. Do you think your parents pulled away from you? Or do you think you pulled away from your parents? In maturity, we'll say, my parents pulled away from me. Maturity will say, the wages of my sin, the choices I was making out of alignment with what was right, I chose to push away from my parents. And then all of a sudden you walked in the door one day and there was a disconnect. And you said, my parents don't love me. And the enemy said, you're right. The wages of your sin has left you disconnected and guess what, you're right. They don't love you. And you went further down a path of of disconnect. And today you're still estranged from them, trying to recapture a relationship with God, but it started in the root of my way. You ever been there in your marriage? You walked in day number one, and there was so, it was so vibrant, so much love, and then you walked in day, f- whatever, 1,085. We'll just throw a number out there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the love has grown cold, and you feel disconnect. What happens? It's little decisions over a long period of time that drives disconnect. It's the challenges that we face where we stopped daily making choices to remain in the relationship and then over time we find disconnect. 
You may be in this place today because you're realizing the weight of your decisions has led you to this moment here today where you woke up and now you feel disconnected with a God that you used to once to, one, uh, at one time felt so close to. You're sitting in this place here today desperate for a miracle, as I said, for a breakthrough with God. You, you once knew him so intimately. And today yet you feel so far away. I don't, God has not pulled away from anybody. God has not pulled away from you. God is pursuing us. He's coming after us. He loves us. He wants deep relationship with us. He once was far off, and it was through the sacrifices and the works of man, the legalistic, the law. We had to fulfill the law in order to be in relationship. But he moved on our behalf through Jesus Christ to bridge the gap. To say, I love you, and I am for you, and I want relationship with you daily. God has never pulled away from any one of us. He's pursuing us. You probably feel it right now as you're sitting in your seat. He's pursuing me. He's pursuing me. He wants to know me. God does not want behaviors. He's not looking for your behaviors to, to change. He's looking for your heart. And from your heart, your behaviors will change. Right here today, the first thing I'll leave you with is religion wants your presence or wants your decisions. I'll say it that way. I'm changing a little bit from what I submitted to him. But he, religion wants your presence. Religion wants your actions is what I'm trying to say. They want, they want your, your like decisions. <sighs> Come and do right. That's religious activity. Relationship desires your heart. Jesus wants relationship. And when Jesus has your heart, then, oh, he'll get all the actions. Faith is about this. I'm growing more and more in love with Jesus. And, and the more I know him, the more I love him. And the more I love him, the more I want to serve him faithfully. You know, the challenge of a lifetime is capturing the heart of your kids. I'm a parent right now uh, with, with an eight-year-old and a, and a five-year-old. And my goodness, sometimes they, they think I'm the devil. <laughs> they want to do their way. And I'm like, no, do it this way. And they're like, no, I want to do it this way. And I'm like, no, do it the way I told you to do it. And like, I hate you. <laughs> I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And it's this, this constant battle inside as a parent to capture the heart so that when you say something, they, un they understand the love that is behind it to give them direction not to harm them. And it's so hard, especially when they become teenagers because they lose their minds. You know what I'm saying? I don't even have a teenager. I used to be a student pastor. 10 years as a student pastor, man, that old. I mean, if you can do that, you can do anything, okay? I know, Terry, you're in special ops and you've done some crazy things, but I have too in student ministry, okay? I've got a little street cred, you know what I'm saying? These kids are crazy. They lose their minds. And you're like constantly, you know, I tell parents all the time, as teenagers, you're not probably going to be able to capture their attention, but you can let them know your heart. And I tell you, it's much like the, the story of Luke 15 that I talked about just a minute ago on the father's just at the edge of the property constantly showing that I, I'm ready for restoration with my child. And as a parent, you get into those teen years, man, you're just like loving on them and encouraging them. And you're not, they're like, ah, you're just like, I love you, I'm with you, for you, come on, let's go. And this journey is, is capturing heart in order that actions easily follow suit. And when God has our heart, it's very easy to give up our way. When God has our heart, it's not hard to give up things that complicate our relationship with him. It's not hard to do those things, but when we hang on to our way, you'll live in depression for 10 years because you're hanging on to your way. You'll live in anxiety for 20 years because you're hanging on to your way. You'll live in addiction for a long period of time in your life because you're hanging on to your way. You'll be an adulterer inside of your heart, lusting at everything that walks by if you hang on to your own way. But if you want to be set free, come to Jesus Christ and he'll set you free from the desires of this world. Relationship with Jesus. Jesus wants our heart. Here's the challenge Jesus would give to individuals that have got lost in behavior modification, got lost in religion, got lost in legalism. Come on, you may be in here today 
with a very religious spirit from what you come from, the denomination you come from. I grew up in a legalistic church. We couldn't even go see a, a movie. The devil was in there. <laughs> right? Now, there is some truth about some of the movies, but some are good, wholesome movies. They're good movies. Everything can be used by the enemy to bring uh, chaos. But it was legal. No. It's like, well, what is Jesus saying? Does Jesus have your heart? Unless Jesus has your heart, then, then we can move in a direction on, well, what is he speaking to you today? But Jesus confronted religious people, Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, it says, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy and full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first you wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean. What is it? Behavior modification. Look better on the outside. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. Get over behavior modification. Clean the inside of the cup. What is in your heart? What is illuminating your life? What is on the inside of you? There's a very dysfunctional ideology that is flowing through this generation that is rooted in selfish indulgence, self-righteous mentalities. That isn't saying, what does Jesus think about it? It's saying, what do I think about it? And I'll tell you today, you can, it's revealed in the heart of man that time after time after time, the moment that man gets power, they bring destruction to innocent people. I'm not going to name names, and I'm not here to go through the world history. But when man gains power, they destroy human innocent lives. This is not going to be behavior modification. It's going to be heart transformation through Jesus Christ. He says, clean the inside of the cup, then the outside will begin to look better. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you like white, you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Y'all ready? I know I'm getting into the trenches here today. We talked about in the month of March, this is who we are as a church. All people come into this house. We're building it on the name of Jesus Christ, not woke ideology. We are a church that wants people growing in a relationship with him, not just sitting in a seat. What did we say last week? Everybody's got to come to the cross. If you don't come to the cross, there is no resurrection life. The power comes from resurrection life. This week I'm here to say, if you want to build a faith that is bigger than the adversity that this world will bring, that the liar, the cheater, the deceiver, the enemy, Satan inside of this world, if you want to be able to withstand the, 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 the challenges of the enemy and resist the devil and he will flee from you, you will have to know Jesus. Amen. Not just know about Jesus. You will have to know Jesus. There's a difference between knowing and knowing Jesus. Let me ask you one question before I jump into that. If you are a heart that is following Jesus Christ, this, I'm going to speak to everybody in the room. What is one thing in your pursuit of Jesus in the last six weeks, one thing that Jesus has, has challenged you in through the power of the Holy Spirit, one thing that you've been challenged in your walk with Jesus, one thing in the last six weeks, think about it just for a second. One thing. It doesn't matter if you've, been, you've known Jesus for a, a week or you've known him for 60 years. Everybody in here should have at least three or four things. Man, I'm working on this right now. I'm really challenged in this area of my life because we're pursuing Jesus and he's revealing the cup that's being cleaned. He, he's revealing where we're off in our side of our lives. It's the daily pursuit of picking up our cross and following him. It's the dying to ourselves and coming alive in Christ. And that's a daily process. We should have like, man, I'm really working on this area of my life right now. Man, this area. Got to get better inside of here. There's a difference in knowing about and then knowing. You know, I knew, I knew, let me get into new, known, you get what I'm saying, knowing and knowing is different. I knew, I'll say knew, you can understand the context here. I knew my wife was beautiful when I saw her in seventh grade. 
braces and all, I say, yes, Lord. <laughs> when she walked into school in eighth grade, I knew she was beautiful. And I'll just say, she looked a little better without the braces. I'm just going to throw it out there. Just, <laughs> no, just throwing it out there. It looked a little better without the braces. And there was a, a knowing of beauty, but then there was a knowing of beauty when I pursued When I started to pursue her, then I became, I began to know her. And when I began to know her, then I was like, oh, you look good on the outside and you look real good on the inside. I tell young people all the time, I didn't marry my wife for her beauty. I married her for her, the beauty on the inside of her. There's too many people in this generation looking at the outside. So many people in this generation are overwhelmed with lust in their private life that they are consumed in their public life and they chase after things that look good. Oh, but jack you up. Woo! You want a date? You got a date to know the person. They just can't be beautiful. Oh, I know they're beautiful. There's a lot of beautiful things. God created us. Come on, somebody. Tap your neighbor. God created you. You're beautiful. Amen. Yes. But a knowing is through relationship. There's a lot of people that know Jesus, but Jesus doesn't want you just to know him. He wants you to know him. You get what I'm saying? He wants you to know him. I'm going to read this real quick, and it's going to get challenging. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, it says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. I never knew you. What does it say? Get away from me, you who breaks God's law. In the knowing, there's actions that live in alignment with the law. Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. But he paid the price of the consequences of the law, which is death, so that we could live in freedom above the law, as we talked about last week, over the law, over sin. The law is given to expose our sin. There's a difference when we know him and we know about him. Many people, Lord, Lord, I did all this in your name. He's like, yeah, good, good job. You took the power of my name because you knew it, but you did not walk in my power because you know me. And I'll tell you, this is one of the scriptures inside of here. When I read it, I'm like, oh, Lord, let, let that not be me. And I'm just as accountable to this as you are. Me, we're on the same page. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Lord, we did some amazing things. We did some crazy things. It was amazing. Your power is at work. But did I know you? You know, there's two different forms in the Hebrew of the word no. There's the yada and there's the ben. The ben is I know intellectually about you. The yada is I know intimately about you. We've had so much intimacy. I have experience with you. I have time with you. I got the yada. Come on, somebody, get that yada. Say, what you want? What you want with God? I want yada. What you want with Jesus? Give me that yada game. Amen. <laughs> intimacy. You've probably heard this said, I see into you. There's a lot of marriages in here that more than likely know each other physically, but have struggled in order to know each other emotionally, intimately. The physical is so easy because our eyes, <laughs> our endorphins, our biology. <gasps> the emotional intimacy where we see into each other is a hard one. And those are decisions that we make on a daily basis in order to pursue to not just get the physical, but to know the individual. Ooh, say that twice. 
It's the pursuit on a daily, I don't know if I can say it again, it just load. <laughs> it's the pursuit of, uh, daily pursuit of individuals to know, I can't even say it right now, okay? So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully somebody wrote it down. That's just the flow of the spirit, amen? You got the yada, you got the bin. Do you know Jesus? Or do you know Jesus? Do you know about him? Or have you had deep, intimate times with him? If we've had deep, intimate times with him, then more than likely, our lives will look like it. If we have deep, intimate times with God, our belief will be rooted in truth, and that truth will inform our lives. An informed life on what truth is lives a life of action that represents righteousness and the love of God inside of the world. What flows from that? Decisions of silence and solitude, getting into places inside of your life to say, you know, I'm pursuing you, Jesus, and with that, I'm going to get quiet with you. What is it? Times of prayer. We say, I'm going to slow down life and I'm going to tune in. I'm going to give my thoughts and I'm going to put them up there. And you're, he's making intercession for us. He's working on our behalf. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And we're saying, God, we need you to move in this. And then we slow down and say, God, what are you speaking now? We're not just here to blah, verbally vomit on God. But we're here to say, God, what are you speaking to us? We have these moments where we say, God, we're going we're gonna to push away from things inside of this world. And there's times whenever we literally fast. We don't eat a meal and say, God, I'm going to pursue you rather than pursuing food right now. I want your sustenance inside of my life, not the sustenance of man that's on this earth. And we tune in by fasting and God moves in our life and we're growing up and we're building our faith. And there's moments inside of our lives whenever we're walking on side of, in this journey where we're, we're at church and we're growing and faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And we don't forsake the gathering of the brethren, but our actions are saying, God, we're in relationship with you. So we're in the house with you to build up our faith. And there's moments that we have where we're just in God's word and God's word is reading our mail and God's word is speaking to us and encouraging us. I just talked to a man before, uh, Nico, and he said, Pastor, like, how do, I, how do I go? How do I immediately start growing in my faith? I said, immediately, if you want to start growing inside of your faith, you've got to get into God's word. Everything else is going to be good, but God's word is sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides both uh, bone and marrow. Man, it cuts between the lies and what truth is. It enlightens darkness. The truth of God's word has it. The word says that. And you get into God's word and you're in it consistently, man, it'll begin to illuminate your life, transform you. And then I said, this is what you got to do. And you can't just know about it. You've got to be able to go do it. You've got to be able to step into your workplace and love people that don't look like you. You've got to be able to love people that are far from God. If you don't have the grace that has transformed your heart to love people where they are at, then I don't know that the word has touched your heart. Because everything about God is he moved in our direction and our brokenness and our pain. And he loved us where we were at. So we can't get caught up in the word not transforming our lives. James chapter James chapter 1, verse 19 would say it this way. Understand this, my brothers, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires, so get rid of all filth and evil in your lives. And humbly accept the word of God, word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself walk away and forget, about, uh, forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Let that word take root inside of your life. Let that word capture your heart. Don't be an individual who gets lulled to sleep. An individual that on the journey you get tired of doing good. On this journey you get, you get caught in religious activity of showing up but not opening up your heart. You get caught in the, the religious activity of like showing up and looking good and like talking to people about you know, the word. And then you're not actually in the word yourself. You, you got comfortable in your walk where you felt proficient enough to look good on the outside. No, no, no. Let the word transform you. 
Let the word empower you. Let the word strengthen you. Let you become all that it says. And let you be full of the Holy Spirit as you live this life. We have an individual inside of our church, and I have his testimony. I don't know where it's at right now. I guess I lost it in transition. But This individual will speak this last week saying, Pastor, man, 10 years ago, God set me free from homosexuality, lying, cheating, uh, stealing. He said, I was stealing from I was stealing from my own family, and 10 years ago, I met Jesus Christ and made him Lord and Savior of my life, and he set me free. The bondage of that chaos, he set me free. Set me free from all the madness. But it was in this moment that he became vulnerable with God that he actually opened up his life. You know, there's individuals in this house right now that in the totality of your decisions, you're realizing that you ran after the wrong things and what you thought was light is darkness. And you're coming to the the awareness now. The wages of your decisions have brought separation between you and God. God wants to meet you today. God wants to meet you. Luke chapter eight, you find the story of uh, of Mary Magdalene and the Bible would tell us very quickly, Mary Magdalene, Magdalene came along with the disciples. She's also the one that anointed Jesus' feet with a perfume and was criticized for it. But the start of Mary Magdalene's journey was she was demon-possessed. She had all these spirits on the inside of her. And Jesus met her in a moment of grace and said, I love you, demons gotta go. And she had this intimate moment where she was revealed before Jesus, stood before him, and was set free. Just telling you today, like, we don't want to get lulled to sleep on this journey that we can't be open with God. Paul's indication to to individuals in in, uh, 1 Timothy, I believe it was, 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 3, sorry. It says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very, uh, very difficult times for people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Key point here. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Let me say it again. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. This is last day times. However you want to perceive last day times, we could be like tomorrow, maybe. Could be 10 years, maybe. Could be 100 years, I don't know. When Jesus was asked, he said, no man knows the day nor hour. What do I say when it ha- what, what he says? Whenever it happens, there's going to be two people working together in a field. One's going to be gone. One's going to be staying there. So what do we say around here in our church? We're going to be a church that's found in the field. Not in a bunker. No, no, no. We're not religious people that deny the power or reject the power. We got the power of the Holy Spirit at work on the inside of us. We pack in heat. So if you're in here and you're in the journey and you've got far away from God or maybe just maybe you're like, you've known Jesus for a long time. But it's been a minute since you know Jesus. Oh, you know, you know about him, all about him. You can quote the scriptures. But you don't know him. Today's the day to say, come on. Open up the eyes of my heart, Lord, again. May I see again. May I feel again. May I have passion again. May I feel that fire again. May I I have a desire and a passion to know you more again, God. May I dive deep into my relationship. May I open up the eyes of my heart to see him and know him again. Come on. Open up your heart here today. Let's stand up to our feet. I just want to have a moment as a church, wherever we're at on the journey, wherever you're at on your faith journey, just begin to open up your hearts, just open up your lives. 
Say, God, I want to meet you here uniquely. I want to meet you right here in this place. I open up my heart to you, God. What do you want to do in me today? I don't want to eat what I ate yesterday. I don't need any leftovers. I want the fresh, I want a fresh word. I want a fresh encouragement. I want a fresh touch from the Holy Spirit. Come on, just begin to open up your life today. Just sing it out and say, God, what are you speaking to me today? What do you want to do with me today? Come on. Open the eyes of my heart.
relationship? What are you holding against others that's holding you back from God? The Bible's telling you you can't be forgiven unless you're forgiven. What are you sitting in here today in resentment towards those that have gone before you that have harmed you? What today are you mad about that you feel like you should have that God has not given you? What dollar amount that is not in your account today that you you wish you had and today because it's not there you pushed away from God? What void are you pursuing today feeling like it's going to be at the end of a dark road all to find out you're just lost in a very, very dark, long, empty, broken tunnel. I stood before a pastor four years ago, one of the fastest growing churches in the 2000s. He looked at 40 pastors in a room. We were there and he said, one thing I have for you, that when you preach this word, this word touches your heart before it ever comes out of your mouth. That this word does not come from the word to your mouth to the people. Let it come from the word to your heart before you ever speak to people. The man was in tears. He was a broken man, a challenged man, rose to greatness of church doing incredible things I could say his name and everybody would know but he looked at 40 pastors and said never never preach the word without having it in your heart I would say the same thing he said to us the same thing I would say to you make sure this word is touching your heart before you go try to live this life you step out of these walls you will wind up in brokenness if you do not have the game plan. What we're talking about today is growing and knowing Jesus as he teaches us this word right here. He's already taught it. It's already laid out, but he said, let me teach you. And the Holy Spirit will what? Bring to remembrance all that it's in. And as you grow in strength, you'll be able to face the adversity of life. If you're in here today and you feel broken, lost, hurting, the wages of your sin, the wages of your life has led to brokenness. Maybe it's time to say that darkness needs to be illuminated by the power of Jesus Christ and the sin that is represented in that darkness needs to be remembered no more and that's only broken by the perfect lamb that was slain for our righteousness, Jesus Christ. That's it. If this is you today, you feel the overwhelming disconnect between you and God. Maybe you've never met him before. Maybe you've never said yes to Jesus and restored relationship with him, with God through his son, Jesus. He is the good shepherd. He is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to get to the Father except through him. He said it. I didn't say it. He said it. There's no other way. It's not good acts. It's not religious behavior. It's profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Right? So that no man can boast about it. It's faith in Jesus Christ, not in the works. It's faith. So if you're in here and you're disconnected from God, as I've told you before many times, head up, eyes open. If you can't say it in here in front of believers, you'll never live it out there in front of unbelievers. If you want to meet God and close the disconnect between you have have with him, it's time to come to the cross before Jesus and say yes to him. If that's you, just throw your hands up. That's me. I want to meet Jesus today. I I want to stop the disconnect. I want to restore my relationship with God today. Get back in relationship with Him. Hands up. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Amen. We're going to say a prayer in just a second. We'll rededicate our lives to Him. Be illuminated again in Christ. Picking up our cross today. Following Him. Letting go of our way. Choosing God's way in Jesus' name. The other side of it is, if you're in here today, it's been a long time since Jesus has known you. It's been a long time since Jesus has seen into you. It's been a long time since you've had a fresh touch from God. I believe today it can happen right now. 
if this is you, you know Jesus, but it's been a long time since you've known him and he's known you. Raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I'm ready to step back in. I'm ready to step back in the game. I'm ready to start to pursue again. I'm ready to start moving in that direction again. I'm ready to open up my heart again. I'm ready to be a disciple again. I'm ready to pick up my cross again and follow Jesus. I'm going to do it daily. Amen. Come on, in Jesus' name. Amen. Very simple. Romans talks about, we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we shall be saved. If that's not you getting saved today and rededicating your life, you're just recommitting to say, I'm pursuing. Let's say it together. But belief in our heart that it's going down in Jesus' name for our lives. Amen. Let's say, Jesus, we thank you for your life and the way you lived it. You represented truth so well. And today we receive it in our lives. You are the way. You are the truth. And you are the life. I want to get to the Father. And I know it's through you. So come into my heart. Forgive me for my sin. The things where I've fallen short. Say, forgive me coming to you Jesus may you remember my sins no more and set me free from whatever oppression and bondage I'm living in here today in Jesus name we pray and everybody says amen and amen in the house here today amen come on we believe we believe there's a party going down in heaven for the decision you made if you said yes to Jesus and rededicated your life Right when you're walking out these doors, hang a left and go down. Our team is ready for you because you're just new in faith. So we want to walk with you on the discipleship process. Salvation is a moment. Following Jesus is a lifetime. Sanctification is a lifetime. Our responsibility is to disciple you. So walk over to the left. We want to help disciple you in your walk with Jesus. Everybody else, whatever was stirred in your heart today to do by the power of the Holy Spirit, may you have the courage and conviction to live it as you walk outside of these doors. Amen. May you be fresh of the Holy Spirit. May you walk in its power. May you not deny that power that can make you holy. And let's see the world changed by the power of Jesus Christ.